Hello, good morning everyone. This is Kelly Martinez with UFCW Local 5. Thank you for joining us on this morning's Telephone Town Hall for Rayleigh's and Nob Hill members. Um, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to our UFCW 5 President, Ron Lind. Ron, are you still there? I'm still here. Thanks, Kelly, and good morning everybody, and welcome to the second of two of these Rayleigh's Nob Hill contract Telephone Town Hall meetings. Um, you know, as I said last night, this is a non-traditional approach to contract information meetings, but you know, we have members that work in your company from Ukiah to Watsonville, and we've just determined this is the best way to reach the most members in a reasonable time frame. Uh, we could have set up or tried to set up area meetings conducted by various staff members, but given the circumstances, we just thought it was important that everybody had the opportunity to hear the explanation from their president, and this is the best and only way to do so. Uh, I've heard from five or six people over the last days objecting to this procedure. Uh, you know, they've claimed I'm afraid to, afraid to face the members or we're hiding the ball or whatever, which is, uh, you know, total bull. Uh, those of you that have known me for a long time, and I've been around a long time, know that uh, I have no problem talking to members and meeting with members and facing members when times are good or when we have difficulties. And my preference would clearly have been to meet with each of you in person at meetings so we actually looked into it but we would have had to schedule 16 meetings in eight days at various locations, not to mention 20 or more meetings for Safeway employees at the same time. Most of our unit offices aren't big enough, and getting outside meeting venues in December is a problem. In other words, a logistic nightmare. I also want to point out that we did live meetings on the initial SaveMart vote, 20 different meetings, a more complicated contract, and less than 25% of the members showed up. We did a follow-up uh, telephone uh, meeting for a follow-up vote, we had a better turnout. So this is the best way to get the information to all of you uh, in, a, in an efficient manner. As we explained in the packet, you have the opportunity to ask questions via email, phone call, come into the office, and so on. And obviously, union representatives are going to be in your stores over the next several days. And some of you haven't been shy about emailing me or calling me or whatever, and I, I, as quickly as I can, do respond to people. So we clearly want you to be informed before you vote. Uh, also, right off the bat, I want to answer a question raised by a few of you, which is why didn't we vote before ending the strike? And the answer to that is simple. As you now know, the quickest ratification process we could pull together took a couple weeks. The company gave in on the two primary causes of the strike. And we didn't think it would be proper to keep people out for two or more weeks uh, longer pending a vote on a settlement that we are recommending for approval. So joining me on the call this morning is Joe Sweeney, our health benefit consultant. Joe will be describing changes to the benefit plan and the reasons behind them a little later. And these changes will affect all Local 5, 8, and 648 members in the retail food division. Before I go over the proposed settlement, I want to provide some background. Uh, first and foremost, I want to once again congratulate you on a very successful strike that made a tremendous difference in the offer that I'm about to explain. Your courage, your commitment during a time in our history when few workers are willing to risk a labor dispute, particularly in retail food stores, and particularly after the four-and-a-half-month strike several years ago in Southern California, uh, this is going to be remembered as an important milestone in the history of our union. Uh, by the way, we're currently producing some commemorative T-shirts and buttons for uh, those of you that were on strike, and we hope you'll be proud to wear them. I also want to tell you how close we came to asking you to return to the picket line last week. As you know, for some unknown reason, the company chose to implement the terms of the proposed agreement, at least the economic terms, the Sunday and holiday premiums, prior to the conclusion of the ratification process. This is a clear violation of the contract extension that the company signed as part of the strike settlement. And to be honest with you, it's a sign of bad faith, a, a just reprehensible sign of bad faith, but it's consistent with the approach that the company took throughout negotiations that resulted in the strike. I heard this news last week while I was finally on a short vacation, and I have to tell you, I was so pissed off about it. My first instinct was to scrap the entire settlement and resume the strike, but the lawyers told me, can't do that. It's a problem. So I've instructed our attorneys to file a grievance over this issue as well as unfair labor practice charges against the company with the National Labor Relations Board. And I assure you, we will take all possible legal action to get back pay with interest for those of you that have been unfairly and prematurely impacted. I know many of you are very angry over this issue, and rightly so, and obviously so am I. 
That being said, we have a proposed agreement before you. It's not one that uh, you know people are going to jump up and cheer about, but given all the circumstances before us, it's one that we feel compelled to recommend. Here's the facts. Your company is losing money, and not just a little. I had the burden of twice seeing their overall financial statements. I've seen store-by-store store numbers. Um, they are uh, not pretty, not only for Rayleigh stores, but for Knob Hill stores as well. The ongoing effects of the economic crash are more critical. The onslaught of low-wage, low-benefit, non-union stores that you see all around you has had a devastating impact on union operators, including Rayleigh's, and not just here in Northern California, but throughout the country. It's had a terrible impact. Here's the thing. If you include the cost of our benefits, the lowest paid worker at Knob Hill or Rayleigh's earns nearly $20 an hour. Wages and benefits, the lowest paid, 20 bucks an hour. At Target, Walmart, Grocery Outlet, the list goes on. The highest paid workers don't earn nearly that much unless maybe they're a manager. Now, I want to remind you, when we did the original contract surveys, and it's a long time ago now, the vast majority of you said, just keep things the way we are, the way they are, and we will all be happy. Well, we did that for more than a year, uh, which didn't make your company happy, but we did it for more than a year. That's five years of wage increases and free health benefits, better than those enjoyed by any UFCW members in this country. Now, the strike was about two primary issues, maintaining and funding your union health benefit plan for members, families, and retirees, and avoiding permanent reductions to Sunday and holiday premiums. We were successful on both of those issues. With the ratification of this agreement, affordable union health care benefits will continue. Sunday and holiday premiums will be suspended, not eliminated, in return for important contract language improvements. Here's the bottom line, guys. Failure to take action to deal with the company's ongoing economic difficulties will result in more store closures and more job losses. There's no way to get around that. We're not even sure that, uh, you know, how long this could have gone without the company, uh, um, you know, starting to make those store closures immediate. Uh, could we have continued the strike? Of course. But I was absolutely convinced that in doing so, many of you would have not had jobs to return to. Uh, it was a difficult decision, but one that I had to make. Again, let me make it clear. What is before you is much better than what was on the table when you struck. In healthcare alone, you were successful in winning an additional 60 cents an hour that wasn't on the table before, 60 cents that avoided more serious benefit modifications than the ones that we're going to describe tonight. So let me go over the agreement. I'm not going to read it word for word. Some of it's pretty self-explanatory. And um, most of what I talk about will apply both to Rayleigh's and Knob Hill stores. There are a few sections that apply just to Knob Hill, and I will uh, spell those out as we go through it. So first of all, uh, point number one, the company has agreed to card check neutrality language. This means clearly that in their non-union stores, and I think we have nine or ten of them, all Rayleigh stores, Local 8 has, has even more than that, uh, those workers will now get to choose whether or not they want to be represented by a union without harassment by the company or without intimidation. Um, union representatives will have access to those stores to talk to those employees, and if a majority sign up for union representation, the company will recognize the union, and uh, they will have a union contract. That's important. That's something that we have fought for with this company for decades. The fact that they're currently what we call double-breasted union stores and non-union stores has undermined your conditions, basically, your strength, uh, the solidarity of our union. And finally, we're going to have an opportunity to resolve this. Okay, point number two, this is about uh, wall deli items, and it just clarifies that uh, everybody uh, you know, can work those items that are on the wall deli. Point number three, this is a meat department issue. Those that are in those meat departments that are doing sales of $33,500 or less per week, uh, that they can have one meat cutter on duty, and that um, but they, they also have to continue to abide by the meat cutter on duty language. There's a measuring period, and it also allows for... Uh, meat clerks to grind meat when the meat cutter has gone home. And the, the point behind this is they're having a sale on ground beef and uh, meat cutter's off and the, the counter's empty and there's no ground beef and customers are looking for it, then the meat clerk can grind. 
The next point uh, about eliminating the second paragraph, this just is old cleanup language about going way back when assistant managers were originally reclassified. The next point about salesmen, this is also outdated cleanup language, no change to the restrictions on outside vendors doing your work. Uh, we eliminated traveling clerks language, we no longer have traveling clerks. Uh, the unemployment list, or the unemployed list, we've eliminated that because it's outdated language. We no longer uh, really dispatch people other than meat cutters out of the union halls uh, to fill jobs. Uh, the next one, this is important, that employees should not be discharged, disciplined, suffer loss of seniority, et cetera, for a change in Social Security number. You know, look, we have a lot of our members that come from other countries, and for whatever reasons, uh, you know, they feel compelled to make a correction on their Social Security number. Some companies, and your company has not been, uh, you know, one, one of the ones that have typically done this, but some of the companies have terminated people when they try to change their Social Security number. We think that's wrong, reprehensible, and this language keeps the company from being able to do that. Uh, next is this uh, issue of uh, hiring from sources other than the list maintained by the union. That also applies to the dispatching of people out of the hall. We don't do it anymore, except for meat cutters. Uh, on probation, clarifying that 60 days starts from the first day hired. That's an important little nuance. Contract language is important. Uh, it doesn't start from the first day you work. If you're hired on Monday, but you don't start work until Wednesday, your seniority day or your probation period starts on Monday, the day you were hired. Next, this applies only to Knob Hill. This is the transition of GMCs and meet clerks over to all-purpose clerks. Uh, this was something that was developed in the last contract, and it was, an, you know, it was a way to get to kind of uh, uh, soften the difference or uh, reduce the difference in wages between people that worked in the delis and the bakeries and you know the GMCs and you know people that did other work. Uh, so we de developed this all-purpose clerk classification that people were supposed to transition over to. Obviously, uh, grocery clerks are. Uh, you know, grandfather. But the transition slowed down because the economy slowed down, the company was closing stores, and so it was creating all sorts of problems. So we developed as part of these negotiations an immediate transition, and this spells out what happens when you move from uh, GMC to AP clerk. And some of you, depending on your step that you're at, are going to get wage increases. Uh, if you're an experienced clerk, because you're currently uh, you know, making 1551, for instance, a GMC, you're going to move over to the ninth step of the APC, which would be 1575. And then there's other language there about interim steps and where other people move. And if you are, uh, if you're not an experienced person and you transition over to APC, as you can see, uh, you'll continue to accrue hours, you'll continue to get increases up to the eighth step. And then uh, you know everybody is frozen, you know, because the progressions as part of this whole um, stabilization agreement that I will talk about in a few minutes are frozen uh, above the eighth step. But a significant number of you that are currently general merchandise clerks will get a pay increase as a result of the approval of this contract. All right, the next part is uh, this is about lists. This applies to everybody. It's just that uh, twice a year they have to give us a list of employees in you know, electronic format that helps us to make sure that people's seniority rights are being upheld and so on. Section 4.7 on the list, this is just cleaning up old language. Um, the company's already complied. It was a one-time requirement. All right, this next point is important. This is request for full-time work. This applies to Knob Hill. These next several ones apply to Knob Hill. Railies, you already have a whole different system than Knob Hill with the two classifications, the part-time classification, the full-time classification. At Knob Hill, we have a different approach, and uh, what we're doing with this is eliminating the bidding procedure. As you know, the you know, current procedure, if you want full-time, you have to bid for it, and then you, know, you wind up on this list, and you know, if you remember to do it. Uh, well, now we've replaced this with a part-time, full-time ratio. So first of all, we have to have in each geographical area at least 30% of the people at full time. Now, in some of our areas, they're not at 30%, so they're going to have to create some additional full time jobs. What this also says is that if in an area, if they fall below 30%, and this is food clerks and all purpose clerks combined, if they fall below 30%, they have to go to the most senior person, offer you a full time position, 
and if you don't want it, they go on to the next one, and they have to, you know, do whatever they have to do to fill those full-time positions. This is important. This was one of our goals in negotiations, was to get a uh, minimum percentage of full-time jobs, and this has done it. Um, we, now that we have a side letter that I'll, I'll go over a little bit later, in a couple of areas where we have people, uh, more than 30% currently that are full-time, they can't reduce it down to 30%. It will be done through attrition. The next two points uh, after that for you Knob Hill folks, 15 and 16, are just language that uh, you know go along with this, this new uh, elimination of the bidding procedure. Safety rules um, and, and other, there's other uh, subparagraphs under that. This just changes the language to reflect the new terms for these uh, laws about universal military training and so on. We next have a uh, point about uniforms, clarifying that the employer's got to provide a certain number of uniforms to folks and replace them when needed, you know, shirts or whatever. Uh, the next point about special wear, this just clarifies that those of you that work in inclement conditions, you know, maybe in the freezer or those of you that have to go outside, like uh, collecting carts, you know, you can wear appropriate apparel. Uh, the next point about payday and deductions, uh, this just clarifies when checks are available for pickup and that they have to put on your paycheck stub, whether you're full-time or part-time. This may not seem like a big deal, but it is because, you know, there's always these questions about am I actually classified as full-time or part-time. So this way you know what the company is showing. If you disagree with it, then we have a way to deal with it. The next point about union business, you know, it's amazing how, we had, how hard we had to fight with your company to change the term store representatives to store stewards, because that's what we call those of you that are stewards. Uh, for whatever reason, Raley's hates this term, but they've finally agreed to it. We have modified the non-industrial injury leave from 12 months to 18 months. Under funeral leave, pretty simple. We've added domestic partner as someone that you have a right to have paid funeral leave for, and we have... Uh, for part-time employees, they get one day of paid leave, but an additional two days of unpaid two days of unpaid leave if they desire. On uh, the next point is very important. This is both for Raley's and Knob Hill, although some of the Raley's stores already had this. But all full-time employees that so desire will get two consecutive days off every week starting in January, if that's what you want. So uh, it's your option. You don't have to. If you want split days, that's fine. But if you want two days off in a row, they're going to have to give it to you. The holiday work week, uh, this is for part-time employees. What they've done in the past is if you are a part-timer and you're getting holiday pay, then they, they didn't give you your additional 24 hours worth of, of work because they counted the holiday towards your minimum guarantee. This just says if you get holiday pay, uh, they still have to give you your, your minimum number of hours within the contract. So again, this goes to one of our goals of getting more hours for part-time employees. Posting of the work schedule is moved to 12 o'clock on Wednesday. That's one day earlier. And then we include on the work schedule uh, people listed by seniority, total number of hours. Again, this is to help your union reps make sure that people are getting hours by seniority and that your rights are being maintained. And then there's other language about union reps getting electronic copies and so on. Uh, this next one about meal period, section 7.5, uh, add the following at the end of the first sentence after the word sold. This just is a clarification on meat cutter on duty issue and, and uh, lunch hours. The daily guarantee, it used to be that, uh, you know, we have this four-hour guarantee for part-timers, but there was exclusion. Or excuse me, uh, yeah, four-hour guarantee if you're called in for part-timers, but there was an exclusion for students and courtesy clerks. That exclusion is now eliminated. Head clerks. This is important. All head clerks are to be designated as full-time, regardless of classification. On the all-purpose clerk, this language is just to clarify what happens if you uh, leave and then you come back. You've had previous experience. Depending on how long you're out, this spells out what step you would start at uh, in the scale. We've amended courtesy clerk duties slightly. They can now inflate balloons upon customer request, and they can perform product demonstrations. Now, you know, this is a way for our courtesy clerks to get more hours as well, not so much on inflating balloons, but 
typically companies have hired outside folks to come in and do these demonstrations. Now our courtesy clerks are going to have the ability to do that, or, you know, clerks if the company wants to use them as well, obviously. The daily guarantee, we have modified to clarify that courtesy clerks get a minimum of four, but if for some particular reason, school or whatever, they want to work two hours, then it's okay with, you know, we're fine if they and the, and the manager agree to it, but the member has to agree. The next long section about joint advisory committee, that is just some clarifying language on our meet apprenticeship committee. Next, we have additional language. This is about the measuring period on this meat department issue of the $33,500 or less. Uh, that, again, just tells how we measure it out. Vacation period, this is an important improvement. Uh, we have modified it to say that the vacation period is all year, January 1st through December 31st. We used to have it, um, I think, March through October or February through October, I can't remember at the moment, um, you know, the certain months of the year were, were not part of the vacation period. Now you can schedule vacations, obviously subject to the employer being able to staff the store uh, all year long. Also, we have added language that says employees who have at least two or more weeks of vacation, which is pretty much all of you that are on the phone, I'm sure, you have the option to convert one of those weeks into five individual vacation days. So, you know, if you want to have Take, let's say you have two weeks vacation, you want to take one full week, and then you want to split the rest of it up, take one day this next week, and then one day a couple months later, and you know, so on. Um, and those of you that are full-time, by the way, could try to tie that in with your, uh, um, you know, your two days off in a row. We just think that's an advantage uh, for the way that we schedule the vacations. The next point is on uh, health benefits, and Joe is going to go over that in a few minutes for us, so I will skip over that. On pension, uh, not a lot of language here, but the important thing is this confirms that we have maintained the rule of 85, which is important to a lot of you that have been around a long time, obviously. Term of the agreement, it's a three-year term, but back to 2011, obviously, through October 11th, 2014. Wage rates are frozen for the duration of the stabilization agreement, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, with some exceptions. Um, you know, meat cutters at the seventh progression step and above, fuel station employees, utility clerks, and, of course, those that are transitioning from uh, GMC to APC. There's a side letter. This refers to it. We have eight people in Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito County. I have no way of knowing you're on the phone, but we have a grievance over what we believe was a uh, improper reduction to uh, less than 40 hours a week, and the companies agreed to resolve that as part of the approval of this agreement. Let me talk about this stabilization agreement for a little bit. First, the background. You know, we're dealing with two companies that have serious economic uh, issues, yours, of course, and Save Mart Lucky. And we came up with this concept of a stabilization agreement because, as many of you have pointed out, once you eliminate something in the body of your contract, it's very hard to get it back. So we came up with this concept of trying to stabilize these companies and get them back to economic viability and agreeing to temporary um, reductions on certain things, a lot fewer with your stabilization agreement than with SaveMart, in return for some contract language improvements that are tied together. And the concept being that at some point the stabilization agreement goes away or the company, because they have to continue to provide us economic transparency, uh, they show some minimal level of profitability, and that that's referred to in a side letter I'll go over shortly, uh, you know, these concessions go away. Uh, so that's the concept behind this. So you can see it from the stabilization agreement. If you're looking at it, um, you know, there's an issue around, uh, you know, the company still has some issues around store closures. They've agreed to continue to work with us on it, uh, but they can't, you know, they had some they wanted to close before the end of 2012, and now they've agreed they won't do that. And in fact, you know, they hope to keep them open, obviously, as a result of this agreement. That's what this is all about. Stabilization also says the company uh, has done, will continue to provide us with financial transparency. Okay, the modification, all those little 6.2.1.1 and so on and so forth, all of those relate to Sunday premium and holiday premium. Uh, you know, a lot of the language discusses, you know, Sunday was, is a premium day, if Sunday was the six-day work, 
how overtime would work and all of that. Obviously, with those premiums uh, temporarily suspended, all of those sections don't apply. And this is, this is the one section that, as I said earlier on the phone call, your company decided to implement improperly and illegally that we're dealing with, uh, you know, in a retroactive fashion. Okay, now we are also adding a paragraph that says once per year, full-time employees can request two days off at the end of the work week, two at the beginning of the work week, creating a four-day week in. So, in other words, work week is Sunday through Saturday. You have a right once a year to take off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Obviously, you work five days before or five days after. That kind of gives you another little mini vacation. We call it bookending. On Sunday preference, this is obviously tied with the reduction in the Sunday premium. You know, some of you that have worked Sundays may determine that, well, if it's not a premium day, I don't want to work Sunday. So this language says twice a year, January and uh, July, I guess, semi-annual, you have the opportunity to express a preference for not working on Sundays. And when operationally feasible, the employer will schedule employees off by seniority. So what does operationally feasible mean? The burden's on them. Now, obviously, they've got to have enough people to staff the store. And there are some people that have certain skill set that they may need to have on a Sunday. But for the most part, if you're a cashier, and that's pretty much what you do, or a stalker, and that's pretty much what you do, um, and you've got a lot of seniority, you don't want to work on a Sunday, and you express that preference, then you shouldn't have to work on a Sunday. The next section about night premium, this only impacts new hires after ratification and only for the term of the stabilization agreement, uh, night premium is suspended. Wages, uh, with the exception of uh, courtesy clerks, uh, meat cutters and fuel station employees, starting rate of no less than $10 an hour. This really doesn't affect very many of, of you, of any. Uh, I think we had one, I think there's a starting rate for either GMCs or APCs, I don't have it in front of me, of 995 That would go up to $10. The next point um, discusses the progression steps, that people continue to progress to the top rate of $13 an hour, or at least that's as high as they go for the term of the stabilization agreement, and then they're frozen for the remainder of the agreement, as we've discussed before. On the weekly guarantee, uh, effective upon ratification, with the exception of courtesy clerks, part-timers will be guaranteed 28 hours per week rather than 24. Again, this is part of one of our goals about getting more hours for people. The next point, this is again for new employees after ratification, a change in uh, holidays and also a change in vacations. Again, this is new hires and it's only for the terms of the stabilization agreement. Now, let me briefly go over some of the side letters that also clarify some of these issues and then I'm gonna turn it over to Joe to go over the health benefit issues. Uh, first side letter is about this 30% issue on full-time employees, and again, clarifies that it's by attrition. So if we have an area where it's over 30%, they can't reduce people. Uh, the next one, this is about this one step, and this could impact a few of you if you're at the eighth step in a GMC, and you transition to eighth step APC. We looked at it, and you could have been disadvantaged for a period of time because uh, the wage rates didn't quite match up. So this says if you are one of those few people uh, and you make that transition, you're going to get a $1,000 bonus uh, to deal with uh, that transition. The uh, next side letter deals with, as I said, these eight people that we have grievances pending on full-time reduction down in the Tri-County area. Okay, we also have a side letter on financial statement and stabilization. This is tied to the stabilization agreement, and this discusses some minimal level, 2.5% of uh, net income on gross sales, which is pretty low, to uh, you know verify that the company is actually making some sort of profit, and when the um, reductions, you know, the changes in premium pay would return. Uh, also, and I know some people have raised some concern over this, this talks about if if SaveMart reaches agreement with the unions uh, on any of the temporary concessions, not in their stabilization agreement, but in yours, so we're really talking about Sunday and holiday premium, if by some chance we were to agree to make those permanent at SaveMart, that they would become permanent at 
Nob Hill Railies. Well, this is really what it, the way it's always been. You know, we have we've always had an industry agreement. Um, you know, those of you that've been around a while remember when Sunday pay went from time and two thirds to time and a half. It happened everywhere, and it went from time and a half to time and a third. It happened at all of our companies. You know, it's it's tough enough. We've got this issue of your companies that have don't have a level playing field with all the non-union competitors out there who obviously don't have any Sunday pay or a lot of the things that you do. Bad enough with that, but we can't have companies having an unlevel playing field against the other unit employers that we have. Now, we don't have any intention at this point of agreeing to permanent anything that appear in stabilization agreements, but that's the rationale behind it. All right, just a couple more, then I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Um, Extension agreement during ratification, this one's important because the company signed it, and this is the one that says they're extending the current collective bargaining agreement until we ratify the contract, which is why uh, we are confident that what they've done on Sunday and holiday premiums is a violation. And two more, I think. Uh, nope, already dealt with that one. And already dealt with that one. Oh, lease departments, that's the final one. Your company wants... You know, they're trying to trying to make money. And one of the ways they want to do it is in some of their larger stores where they have excess space, maybe leasing some of that space out for different types of operations. They've talked about a brew pub several times, for instance, other similar, more like restaurant-type operations. This gives them the ability, the ability to do that. This is not about uh, leasing out the uh, pet food aisle or the frozen food aisle or, any, or the deli or anything like that. These are specific exceptions uh, that we've talked about. So that is the uh, contract language, or those are the contract language changes. I'm now in a minute going to turn it over to Joe Sweeney, who's going to talk about uh, your health benefit changes. And, but before I do that, you know, this has been one of the most difficult parts of these negotiations, not only for your company, but for all of our companies. Uh, you've been to meetings, you know, you've heard me several times, uh, you know, talk about this problem where the company is currently paying 6.20 an hour for your benefits. The actual cost is seven dollars an hour. The projected cost is nine dollars an hour. It's not sustainable. We've got this issue of health care reform. Uh, all these things made it to where we had to make some significant changes to the health benefit plan, um, and they're going to apply to everybody, all the companies, people that work for the union, uh, all of us that are in this this plan will be dealing with these, and they're somewhat complicated. It took us a long time. Uh, Joe Sweeney works for the Siegel Company. He's our primary benefits consultant, does a great job for us, does everything he can to, to try to build a, an excellent benefit plan that fits within the budget that we have. And I'm going to turn it over to Joe for a few minutes to explain the changes. I wanted to go over and maybe underscore some of the points that Ron had indicated and explain why this challenging economic retail food environment really, really impact your trust fund and the benefits that they provide. And I wanted to give you some real numbers so that you understand um, concretely what I mean by that. I also want to talk about health care reform and the ongoing significant cost of increases. And there too, I want to try to give you some real numbers so that you understand what I mean by the very difficult negotiation kind of concept that Ron and the rest of the bargainers had to deal with when they were talking about health care reform in this set of bargaining. So the challenging economic environment, how does it impact your trust fund? Well, in 2008, this trust fund had 91 million hours of contributions paid in on its behalf. And I think all of you know, for the way this trust fund is operates is for every hour that you work, whether you are eligible or not, a contribution is paid into the fund, and it is that money, those contributions, that are used to pay all of the benefits of the trust fund. So in 2008, we had 91 million hours paid in at $6.20, let's say. We had 56,000 people that those who were working and had those monies paid in on them. We only had, in 2008, we had 91 million hours, 56,000 people who were having those contributions paid in on their behalf, but only 45,000 of them were actually eligible to participate in the plan. 
And the difference between the 56,000, which are the people who were actually working but not yet eligible, were those people who had just been hired, maybe only worked for three or four months and then left or worked for six months just before they became eligible, they left. And so there was a lot of people back in 2008 who were helping to increase the overall trust fund contributions because the economy was so good that there was a lot of hiring going on. And you folks obviously know that better than I do. Now let's fast forward to 2012. In 2012, we instead of 91 million hours of contributions, we had 79 million hours of contributions. We covered roughly the same number of people. In, two, uh, in 2008, we had 45,000 people covered in this trust. In 2012, we had 43,000 people covered in this trust. So we lost 11, or excuse me, 12 million hours, and yet we only lost a, mu we lost a much smaller number of people who were covered. So what that means, obviously, is we have to you, we have to use less dollars to cover roughly the same number of people. And that is a real economic challenge, directly the result of the kind of difficult economic environment that the stores are dealing with. And, and Ron spent some time obviously going through that. Let me also give you a number that will show you just how costly these benefits are, not just uh, you know, historically costly, but what are their costs going to be in the future? So in 2006, the active benefit cost for this plan was $600 a month. Every single person, all of those 45,000 people were on average $600 a month. When you fast forward to 2012, that cost goes from $600 to $925. If we project that cost out, for just this contract, just until 2014, that cost goes to almost $1,100. So if you look at 2006 being $600, and you fast forward to what would be the end of this contract, the active cost, if we do nothing, would have almost doubled. That's what Ron means by, based on the economic realities that, we, that they as bargainers were dealing with, sustaining the current level of benefits was just not feasible because it would have taken the contribution rate from the current $6 an hour to something in the $9 an hour range. That would have been the requirement that we would have told the bargainers they had to negotiate for us to continue to keep the benefits exactly as they are today. And so the bargainers had to step back and say, okay, how can we develop a plan that is going to provide comprehensive coverage to the membership and yet live within the economic realities that we, are, that we have today. How are we going to be able to do that? And what they decided to do was to look at the plan, to continue to provide comprehensive coverage, but to develop the plan and design it in a way that would encourage and reward members who take proactive engagement in managing their own health care costs, who are working with trust fund identified vendors to manage their own health care situations. And there are a number of different programs that if this is approved by the membership, will be implemented at the, at the trust fund level to essentially do that. And I wanted to briefly talk about some of the programs and then go over the plan design at a high level. So some of the programs that we would be implemented that would in fact encourage a more efficient use of healthcare dollars are things like a market price drug program. And a market price drug program is simply a program that encourages members and their doctors to use cost efficient medications. We have things like medical reference based pricing programs. Again, programs that are designed simply for you and your doctor to utilize those services that are more cost effective than other comparable services in the area. We have the concept of possibly implementing uh, UFCW clinics around the market area as a test site uh, to, again, encourage people to use um, clinics that are cost effective. Cost effective clinics help to reduce our overall costs. Then we have some other programs which essentially are designed to uh, re redesign and realign how the plan administration occurs. And those things deal with uh, working spouses and how we coordinate with benefits. The 
we are in this new program modifying the way in which the working spouse rule uh, works. And essentially, what we're doing is removing the $80 limit that currently exists in the plan. So the new working spouse rule will simply say, if, your spouse, if you have a spouse and she is eligible for insurance through her employment, that spouse must take that coverage and must take the coverage that is at least as comprehensive as the coverage offered through the uh, trust fund coverage. So it's simply modifying the $80 rule that currently exists and, and looking to the spouse's employer to take a larger role in that insurance. We are also modifying the coordination of benefits. Coordination of benefits, for those who don't know, is uh, the way in which this trust coordinates with other insurance. For example, the spouse's coverage. And what we're doing here is simply adopting what is an industry standard approach for many, many years, which is called non-duplication of benefits. Non-duplication of benefits simply means that we will pay no more than had we otherwise been primary. And that concept is run through the uh, coordination of benefits. And that is another administrative change that the trust is implementing. Uh, some things that will continue through the trust that already exist are things like our disease management program. The disease management program, for those of you who may be participating, is a program that essentially looks to control chronic conditions by giving members information about what is uh, the current medically accepted best-in-class approach to their specific disease state. The objective in that is simply to get people to be healthier so that if they're healthier, their long-term costs generally improve. Uh, so we have all of these programs, all of these kind of things that are uh, the intention is to make members better consumers of health care. And then we have to overlay a plan design on top of it. And so the plan design that we're overlaying on top of it is a two-tier approach. There's going to be a two-tier indemnity approach and very likely a two-tier HMO approach. So I'll focus on the indemnity approach, but the goal is that the same thing will apply for the HMO approach. So the indemnity plan at open enrollment will have two tiers. It will have a healthcare partnership tier and it will have a personal direction tier. And those, those names are really exactly what we um, what we expect or want out of a member. Healthcare partnership tier is one where a member has said, yes, I'm okay with proactive engagement. I'm okay with participating with the trust fund and its identified vendors in order to uh, provide me and my family with more information about healthcare and our decisions and our choices. What healthcare uh, partnership will require are things such as the signing of a healthcare partnership agreement, which will essentially outline those things that you and your spouse are, uh, will agree to do, not just in the beginning of the year, but throughout the year. It will, will require you to complete the health risk questionnaire, which has, which has been around for a number of years on this plan. It will require you to get some biometric screening. And biometric screening is essentially uh, key metrics uh, which provide some important information about overall health status. And those are things like height, weight, circumference, cholesterol, glucose, whether you're a smoker, and height and weight gives us your body mass index, and then we have your blood pressure. Those kind of key metrics help both you and your spouse understand kind of key health metrics which you can share and work with your doctor on, but it also helps the trust fund understand broadly what is its population? What, how is its population on some of these metrics? And are there programs that can be developed that can help them and their families improve those metrics? Because by improving those metrics, you improve overall health. By improving overall health, you reduce longer-term health care costs. That's the concept of health care partnership. If you don't want to participate in a health care partnership because you don't want to do all those things, that's fine. There will be this other program for you called personal direction. And personal direction is a program that will essentially require you to do some of the uh, plan designs that will apply to everyone, but won't require you to do the HRQ, won't require you to do health and lifestyle coaching, won't require you to do biometric screening. But what it does require you to do is pay a little more out of your pocket. So the, the plan designs are going to be developed and to encourage people to be a, to participate in the healthcare partnership, because the weekly premiums, 
that are being charged. And as you know, this is the first time weekly premiums will be implemented in this contract. The member in all situations will pay nothing. The spouse will pay something less if, they partic if you and your spouse participate in the health care partnership agreement. The child will pay something less if you and your spouse participate in the health care partnership agreement. The other uh, variables between health care partnership and personal direction are things like the deductible and the out-of-pocket maximum. So depending on your um, discussion with your family and your willingness to um, be much more engaged on an ongoing basis, healthcare partnership might be the uh, program for you. If you're somebody who's interested in just you know, doing things on your own and really don't want the involvement of anybody else, then I think personal direction is probably more for you with the understanding that you're paying more out of your pocket for that ability to essentially just do whatever you want on your own under the context of the broad uh, benefit design. Now, the, uh, as I said, the HMO program is ideally going to look and feel exactly like the indemnity design. Two-tier structure, if you're doing these things and working with us, you will have a slightly benefit level, slightly better benefit level. If you are not, you're going to have a slightly, um, you're going to have to pay more out of your pocket. One thing I want to make real clear to everybody, um, whether you choose personal direction or whether you choose healthcare partnership, these plans, when healthcare services is re are really needed in situations that you never want to find yourself, cancer, premature child, horrible car accident, you know, you name the horrible situation. In any of those situations, both of these plans will provide comprehensive coverage because both of these plans cash hit a threshold. And once that threshold is hit, everything reverts to 100%. So comprehensive coverage is going to be provided regardless of which plan. The question for you is just really how involved do I want to be? And it's that determination or decision on your family's part which is really, I think, going to be the key determination of which plan you want to join. Uh, as I mentioned, the HMO plan uh, will be very much like the uh, PPO plan. The premiums that I mentioned earlier, zero for the member, something for the uh, spouse, depending on which plan you're in, and something per child, depending on which plan you're in, they do cap out at a maximum of, of three on a child basis. So anybody with four or more children, three or more children, uh, you pay only up to that third child, and then any other children are essentially free to the, uh, to the member from a premium standpoint. Uh, the two plans that will be offered uh, with the open enrollment uh, of this new agreement, assuming the members ratify it, are going to be the indemnity plan and the Kaiser plan. Uh, the health net plan uh, will no longer uh, be available. The other major ch or minor changes, excuse me, to the to the trust benefit are a network uh, in the vision service plan, uh, which should not present much problem given that there will be limited to no disruption, and some changes to the disability benefits. Uh, disability extensions will be modified to a maximum of four months um, from the current levels, and there will, they will, we will be eliminating the 12-month extension of coverage when someone becomes permanently and to totally disabled and is on uh, Social Security uh, and Medicare. Uh, and then there were the retiree changes. As Ron had already mentioned, one of the things, one of the big things that this agreement was able to maintain was retiree benefits as they exist today. Uh, and by that I mean retiree coverage for early retirees and retiree coverage for Medicare people. That concept, that, that structure that all retirees are going to continue to have some level of benefits was maintained and is a very important uh, component of what Ron and the rest of the bargainers were able to negotiate. There will obviously be changes to the retiree program, much like there are changes to the active program for the very same reasons. Just the economic realities are such that the retiree benefits um, need to change in order for us to be able to fund the overall structure. Many of the same changes that you see on the active benefits will be made to the retiree benefits, and there are also going to be some changes to the premiums that the retirees uh, have to pay, and those premiums are going to be tiered based on years of service so that somebody who has worked longer in the industry, who has been around for a, a much longer period of time, will pay less than somebody who has been around for, say, 
15 years and compared to someone who's been around for 35 years. Uh, so it's structured based on uh, longevity and, and seniority in order to reward those people who have been in the industry uh, for slightly longer. Uh, so all of these changes combined are the structure that we are you know, looking at initially developing with the understanding that we are going to be kind of tweaking and changing as necessary. We'll improve when we need to and we will adjust when we have to. The, the benefits that are being offered when you compare them to what we see throughout the UFCW industry, not just in Northern California, but throughout the country, continue to be some of the best benefits in the country. They continue to be, from a retiree standpoint, unbelievably superior benefits, then it's very, very rare, very rare for UFCW benefits to provide retiree Medicare coverage. This fund has been able to maintain that this year, which is a very um, you know, significant thing. Uh, I also think the active benefits, although certainly changing, continue to provide coverage that when compared to your other kind of brother and sister funds throughout the country are still far superior. And it's it is in that context that Ron and the rest of the bargainers had to figure out a way to kind of create something that was workable to you, uh, provided comprehensive coverage, but kind of lived with the economic realities as we know them today, uh, and has been, we think, successful in that regard. And uh, I uh, appreciate your time this morning, and thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it, uh, especially doing it from the airport on your way to a meeting. <coughs> Let me just underscore three things on the on the healthcare. Uh, first of all, the you know if you choose this healthcare partnership plan, you know other than the premium sharing, you're going to notice very little change in your out-of-pocket expense. Uh, so keep that in mind. That that's that's the road you choose to to go down. You have to make that decision based on uh, you know what you're willing to do and you know your current health and all of that. Again, it's about your choice. The premium sharing. Uh, you know we resisted this for as long as we could. And we were the last ones out there that don't have premium sharing uh, for for our members. And we were able to maintain, I think we may be the only ones, that there's no premium sharing for the employee. That's kind of our belief, that the employer has an obligation to apply to, to uh, provide employee coverage for health care. But we have to do something, as Joe explained, for um, dependents. This is this is not going to be immediately implemented, all these changes. Uh, we're looking at probably the beginning of the second quarter of next year, somewhere around there. So we have a little bit of time because it's very complicated, a lot of logistics to getting all this stuff underway. All right, so there you have it. Uh, you know, the, the explanation of the contract, the explanation of the health benefit plans, and now it's up to you to decide. Um, you know, as I said, this isn't, uh, this isn't nearly the kind of contract that we – we came to you with five years ago. It's it's not what we you know like to do. We know there are some things in here that are distasteful, um, but you know as I explained earlier, uh, this is what we're faced with. Now I know there's a small group of individuals that have been all over social media, the internet, and so on, disparaging the proposed agreement. And some of them are our members, and some of them aren't. But they've been all over there disparaging the agreement, attacking union leadership, spreading misinformation. Uh, these are some of the same people who spread mis misinformation during our recent union election, and the same people, some of them, who had the audacity to complain that your strike was not being effective enough. You know, some people in this group have stooped so low as to accuse me of selling out our members. You know, I've worked for this union for more than 30 years, 50 to 60 hours a week, week after week, on behalf of the members, and I find that accusation absolutely offensive and unfounded. It would imply that I'm getting something in return for recommending this settlement. Well, I can tell you, I'm getting something. The only thing I'm getting out of this outcome is hopefully the preservation of hundreds of good union jobs. You know, I'm tired, frankly, of bargaining with employers over the effects of store closures and companies going out of business. I've done it on behalf of far too many members in the recent couple of years that are no longer working, well over a 1,000. You know, while some of you may think that the owners should subsidize money-losing stores with their private wealth, I can give you dozens of examples where billionaires close or unload money-losing enterprises. They're just not going to do it. Uh, now, if you want to vote this proposal down over the temporary suspension of Sunday and holiday premiums, I get it. And I and our staff will be back there with you on the picket lines shortly after we count the votes. We can afford to continue to pay strike benefits for about an additional 10 to 12 weeks 
but I have to tell you, as the leader of our union, I cannot in good conscience recommend that you do that. Now, if you want to continue the strike over the health benefit plan design, I can assure you that no longer, no matter how long you stay out, it is not possible to fund the plan in a way that avoids significant design changes. You know, these are difficult difficult times for the UFCW and all unions. You've seen the attacks on unions. You've seen what's, what's gone on with government employees and so on. But at the end of the day, if you accept this proposed agreement, you will continue to enjoy wages, benefits, and working conditions that are better than those provided to more than 90% of the retail workers in this country, union and non-union. So now I'm going to take some questions that Kelly has. She's been uh, looking at the online questions that people are asking and trying to group them into uh, you know, some general questions and some common topics that people have. So Kelly, uh, bring them on. Okay, Ron. Um, yes, we're trying to do our best to group these together, but the probably the most uh, common question is that of scabs. Um, they would like to know if there's any stiff penalties that have been agreed to um, uh, on those clerks that have crossed the line, and, um, and they want to know uh, what those penalties are. Yeah, I, look, I definitely understand uh, the angst that people have about scabs. I mean, I can remember this from the 1980 strike that uh, we had and the 1995 strike and, you know, and others. Uh, I get it. So this is all covered. Um, you know, it would be great. I wish I could say to you, yeah, we're going to – fine them $1,000 or we're going to kick them out of the union or whatever. We can't legally do that. Uh, we have, uh, and hopefully it's done by now, compiled a list of people that crossed and worked behind the line. We've asked our reps and our picket captains to do that, so we want to make sure the list is correct. Um, and then here's how it works. The, the uh, you know, members have a right to um, cite people or file internal union charges against people that do something like work behind a picket line. And if there are people that want to do that to the scabs, they can do it. Um, but we can't do anything to them unless they have uh, they have the right to have a trial before our executive board or a committee of our executive board. And then the executive board can make a determination um, as to what the outcome will be. So it, it's a long and complex process. Um, we will do it if that's what people truly want to do, and I'm getting that message that that is what they want to do. Uh, we're going to discuss at our next board meeting next week sort of the logistics around that. Uh, this won't take place quickly. Um, you know, it's something that we have to sort of work through. The last time I remember doing this, this goes way back, I think it was the late 80s, we had a strike at Jemco, and we had trials for people that, that crossed the picket line. So I get it. Uh, you guys feel very strongly about the scabs, and deservedly so, and uh, you know, I assume that in the stores you're letting those people know what you feel about them, and you know, we'll take as much action as the members and our executive board want to do. Great. Um, a couple of questions on regarding stabilization. Uh, is it an automatic rollover, and why are we tied to the save mark uh, in the stabilization, stabilization agreement? Yeah, so I, I talked about that earlier. We're tied to Save Mart. It's, it's the concept of an industry-wide agreement. It's, it's only tied to Save Mart in th those two specific, really, um, issues, Sunday premium and holiday premium. Um, and, you know, stabilization agreement expires. Now, there's a, you know, a measuring, uh, you know, thing. I talked about that 2.5%, you know, kind of tied together. But, again, the whole concept over stabilization is that company gets back to profitability and the thing goes away. Okay. Um, a couple questions on health and welfare plan. Um, why is the health and welfare plan better than the company's last offer? Oh, that is, that is a good question. So the, the company's last offer that you struck over, number one, it was 60 cents light on the benefit contribution, uh, which, again, would have caused even more reductions. It would have eliminated health care for people that are currently on Medicare, which, you know, ours is an important uh, sort of addition to the Medicare health plan. And it would have moved you all out of the union health benefit plan and put you into the company plan, which initially, if you line up the benefits with the exception of retirees, compares pretty well. But once the control is gone, it's, it, it doesn't have a good outcome. The company is going to have total control over, you know, vendors and plan design and all of that. You know, we have some ability to negotiate over some of that, but we have no input. Uh, no oversight. If you have a problem on you know, the company plan with you know, getting benefits paid properly or you disagree with one of the decisions, uh, 
you have to deal with the company or with maybe their health insurance provider rather than going through the trust fund or talking to your union rep or your union benefits department. Um, you know, there's no you know appeals. There's nobody to represent you in the case of an appeal over a, a non uh, non payment of benefits. So. Those are the things that uh, – that's why the plan that you have now is so much better than what the company had on the table when, when you went on strike. Okay. We had a few questions on um, the transitions from GMC to APC. Well, hopefully I explained that as well. It's a little bit technical, um, you know, but it's, it's all going to happen, you know, fairly quickly. As I said, some people are going to get increases depending on where they are in the staffs, probably most of the GMCs when they move over. And this, obviously, the concept behind APC, that's all-purpose clerk, is people can do everything. So, again, we think this helps with seniority issues, that people with the most seniority can claim hours in various parts of the store. They're not restricted to working in one department or another. So, ultimately, once this transition takes place, like we wish it had, have, like it should have done over the course of this last contract, it's going to be better for everybody. If you are impacted by this, uh, you know, you're currently a GMC and you've got a real specific question, um, feel free to ask that one, either talk to your union rep or, you know, email it or whatever, and we'll be sure to answer it for you. Okay, we had um, a couple on overscale meat clerks. Will their wages be reduced? Yeah, nobody's being, having a wage reduction as a result of this contract. People that are overscale will be maintained as overscale. And we had one on um, if the contract doesn't pass, will it go to the executive board for ratification or will we go back on strike? As far as I'm concerned, if this thing fails, we'll give a very short notice and uh, people will be back on strike. I mean, that's, you know, we'll no longer have an agreement that, that returns you all the work. Again, we're not recommending that, but if that's the course that you decide to take, uh, we'll be there with you. Okay. And we did have one um, regarding champion clerks. Um, as not Hill clerks, uh, I don't understand how the company can claim financial pain while hiring these champion clerks in the stores when the job of signing up customers for the Something Extra card could be signing, signed up by Knob Hill grocery clerks. Can you explain this? Yeah, well, yeah, two things. One is it's, it's totally consistent with their claim of financial hardship because they're not paying these guys, you know, health benefits or, or pension or union scale. So, you know, that that's justified. But what they're, the fact that they're doing it is not justified. It is clerk's work. It should be done by our members. And I've already instructed our grievance department to uh, file a grievance over that. I don't know what the status is right now. Okay. And the last, actually, question sort of comment was um, directed for you, Ron. Ron, as you had mentioned in your opening, none of us are jumping for joy over this contract. But I do think it's important that we need to come together as Knob Hill members. What is our union's plan to get members involved and united? <laughs> well, you know, we, we getting this behind us, these contracts behind us, we've got to focus on the root of all of our problems, which is the non-union competition. Uh, you know, we've got a very robust Walmart campaign that some of you have worked on. We had all these Black Friday actions, got a lot of press coverage over it, and we've got to continue to do that. But we've got to focus on some of these other competitors that are undercutting uh, our union wages, benefits, and working conditions, Target, uh, you know, Grocery Outlet, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Fresh and Easy. We've worked on a lot of those, and we've done a lot. We have spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of your union dues on fighting these companies. We're going to have to do more. We're going to have to provide opportunities for you, our members, to participate um, in fighting against these companies so that not only will we deal with that, but that will help um, – you know, your company and other disadvantaged union companies turn things around, uh, you know, and hopefully stop what's, what's happening and, and, you know, stop this issue where we've got your, the, the cost to your employers for labor costs are so far below, excuse me, so far above what's happening at these other stores. We've got to all focus on that together. Okay. Thanks, Ron. That was the last uh, comment question. All right. Thanks, Kelly. So, look, we um, – as I said earlier, we want to address all the questions that, that come up. Um, and you can, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can communicate with us. And, uh, you know, and let me just turn it back over to Kelly for just a minute. Kelly, would you go over again how people can ask further questions? Okay, Ron, yes. Um, if you'd like to get involved, there's multiple ways to contact. You can uh, email us at getinvolved at ufcw5.org. 
Um, you can email still. If you have questions, we'll do our best to get back to you guys. Um, the email is contract at ufcw5.org. Um, you can call us. Um, you can ask for myself. Uh, and you can call any office and ask for Kelly Martinez, and they'll get, uh, contact, uh, get in contact with me. I'll give you my email, my number, um, and we can definitely get information to you. Have you sign up for text blast, email blast, receive e-newsletters. Um, definitely look on our Facebook, Twitter, and our website, supportgroceryworkers.com, ufcw5.org. So we definitely have different channels for you to get uh